Oakland, California, the reading capital of the world. I am so excited for our interview today. We are speaking with a titan team of investor and operator pair, Bob Tinker. He was the co-founder and former CEO of Mobile Iron and Tehi Nam, managing partner at Storm Ventures. These two leaders have dozens of wins between the two of them and are just rock stars uh, and anchors in Silicon Valley. So over the past few years, they've published not one, but two books on the evolution of the enterprise startup. And you know, I just want to say on a personal note, Mobile Iron, their company, uh, was the first real company I worked for. It's where I met most of my friends uh, in Silicon Valley, where I learned to be a professional, where I met my wife, quite frankly. Uh, and so one thing that I'm just so proud of is in addition to the, all their professional professional success, it's, it's really wonderful to uh, kind of document their influence on my personal and professional life uh, through this interview. So gentlemen, welcome to 99 Pages. Thank you so much for uh, making time for us. It's our honor to be Thank here. You. Thank you. So Bob, uh, if it's all right, I want to start with you. If my memory serves me correctly, you started your career working in IT systems for, yep. I believe, a financial services company. Yep. And then I was you an IT guy at a bank. Exactly. And then you went to GSB. And then, so I guess I'd love to start with what made you want to be an entrepreneur? Um, so when I was an IT guy at a bank, um, I love building stuff. I love technology. It's fun. But one of the things that surprised me and frankly kind of ticked me off <laughs> is that in a lot of businesses, there's kind of a two class system where like there's the technology people and the business people. And frankly, that annoyed me. <laughs> So I was like, all right, I need to go to business school to go learn the business stuff. And then it dawned on me while I was out here in Silicon Valley. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why don't I actually go join some of these small technology companies where it's like the technology is the business and I can kind of have the best of both worlds. And uh, I just fell in love with Silicon Valley and the idea of building companies and never looked back. And it's been, you know, 25 years. Unreal. And Tehi, back to you. I mean, you started off as an attorney with a legal training, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I would love yeah, to hear, right. uh, yeah. How did you end up in Silicon Valley and as an investor? Well, uh, for me, it was a, a bit longer journey, but uh, I, in high school, actually, I always had this sort of vision of trying to help build the perfect corporation. You know, I know it sounds strange for a high school student, but, uh, uh, you know, I always felt that uh, the building block of modern society is going to be like this uh, corporation where, you know, you get to meet the people, work together in a sort of community, just like how you described your early days of Mobile Iron. And so building the right company and the right organization was something that always appealed to me. And uh, and I became a startup attorney uh, at Wilson Sonsini because I just wanted to work with startups. I ended up working with 300. And so I just got to understand uh, the startup journey, you know, of uh, how founders got started, how they went through divorce, uh, you know, brought in investors, you know, just understanding the, the whole journey from incorporation to IPO and beyond. Fantastic. So, Bob, you know, I, one question that I think a lot of entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs want to ask is, what are the right and wrong reasons to start a company? Um, you know, I know we have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs uh, in the audience today. And as you guys get questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Please know that this is for you. You know, Bob, what are the right reasons? When do you know that, hey, you're on to something that you should invest some time and resources into exploring a startup opportunity? Uh, you know, for, for everybody, that choice is personal. And I guess my first comment on that is, you know, make sure as an entrepreneur before you go start something to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself like why do you really want to do this um you know it's not for the faint of heart it's a blast it can be fun but it's also super hard and there's tons of ups and tons of downs and a lot of risk so you know look yourself in the mirror and make sure you're honest with yourself about why you're doing it um in terms of like then figuring out whether your idea is a good one or not um it really comes down do you have sort of the interest in the idea and whatever it is you're going to go do because you got to be sort of intrinsically motivated to go do it um need to have some sort of insight into like do you have sort of a sense for the problem that's trying to be solved one of the real failure modes out there is the sisp solution in search of a problem hey i got this cool idea let me figure out how to get sell it to yeah. um that's sort of a road littered with many tombstones and you know the last one is just the determination which 
it's hard. Like there's a lot of lonely, tough times in building a startup. And, you know, the media sort of likes to glamorize the, the glory of it. But, you know, what doesn't get covered is sort of all the ups and downs in between. Absolutely. Tehi, when you're looking at a prospective uh, company to invest in, uh, how, how do you sense that the, 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 the well thought out process of, of the origin story in a, in a founding team's heads? How do you sense for that? Right. So, um, you know, I look at the startup as a, a journey. And so I, I ask about the origin story of like how the founders met, how what their vision of the company and all that is to more to not to understand where they are right now, but to understand the trajectory, you know, sort of like how, what brought them together, what's their mission, what are the values, because those are the kind of things that will keep the team together, especially through uh, the moments which Bob alluded to, the really tough moments. And that's when that passion and culture and that glue is going to be required to sort of break through. Otherwise, you know, we've just gone through a lot of like founder divorce scenarios and uh, uh, just other challenges. So uh, understanding that journey is really important because as an investor, you know, we're trying to decide, do we want to be on for five, seven, ten years? So, Absolutely. You know, let's. I'd love to double click on this, and, and particularly in your you know journey with Mobile Iron. You know, you and Bob have got twenty years together, and, which is frightening, you know, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's admirable. It's it's something yeah. that I think uh, to find someone who you professionally connect with at that level and to to hook onto each other for so long to me is is an honor. It's 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 a wonderful professional marriage, and I'm curious from your vantage as an investor. How do you think you look at things differently versus an operator like Bob? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest difference is as, and this we use this metaphor a lot about the surfer and the, the helicopter, is that as an investor, uh, I'm in a helicopter above the water. What that means is, first of all, I don't get wet. And, and uh, uh, I, I have perspective and I'm, I'm like watching, you know, five, 10, 15 surfers and sort of seeing what's hot, sort of what are the, the trends, the waves and that kind of stuff. But uh, I, I, you know, I know emotionally I'm not going to live or die on one surfboard, whereas more so the operator, but the entrepreneur on that surfboard is all in on that one ride and understanding what the other surfers are doing or the wave, the things that the investors are talking about from their perspective is less relevant than just avoiding wiping out right in front of me. Well said. I, yeah, Bob, I'd love, to, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What does is, what is Tehi give you that you couldn't provide on your own? Um, so, yeah, Tay's right. Like, it is funny. Like, you know, investors sort of have this perspective and view whereas the operator you're on your surfboard and you're like i gotta make this work or we die like it's just a really different feeling um but it is really useful to be able to get sort of that external pattern recognition uh the coaching about what's next um you know if you think sort of our two personalities are somewhat different t he's a very organized framework guy and i'm a little bit more sort of what's the punchline? like how, how can i make this actionable how do i think about this and so in many ways, we complement each other. Sometimes we get a little frustrated with each other when he's in framework mode and I'm in punchline mode or the other way around. <laughs> but that's actually part of sort of the healthy resolution to be able to look at it from both our points of view. Super helpful. Fact, you know, when we started the book, we had dueling chapters. But <laughs> that result, it, it took uh, four years to reconcile our views, <laughs> even though we worked closely together for you know 15 years. It was hilarious. Like all these like historical events where we're like we're talking about it and he was looking at it one way and i'm looking at the other we're like what <laughs> so, and we both lived through these things it was funny like and but yeah. reconciling that was actually really useful to sort of draw like what's the lesson out of this that other people can frankly take advantage of so um it was a really well, useful journey for the two of us and board members have different perspective of the same issue I love it. That's so valuable. Folks, if you don't mind, I'd love to turn. We got some great questions coming in from the live chat uh, that I would love to, to hand it off to them for. So first, I'd like to call out Michael Burns, uh, actually my former, another former uh, boss of mine from the Army, 
uh, who is now doing his own startup uh, and, and is ex extremely successful. Uh, Mike asks, do you believe organizational culture informs your product or service, or do you think your product service type drives your culture? I think it's really interesting. You know, it's a you know chicken or the egg between culture and uh, and your product service. Uh wow, that is a spectacular question. Um, Actually, I'm going to reframe the question a little bit because actually Michael left out one other really important thing about that, which is the third leg of that is your team and your people, right? That culture and product strategy are not sort of independent of who the people are that are actually embarking on that journey. So I'd say there's sort of three things that loop in there. Um, you know, this is going to be kind of an annoying answer, but there's a bit of a recursive loop between those two things. I don't think it's appropriate to say one drives the other. I think that kind of binariness ends up sort of becoming a bit of an academic debate. Um, I will tell you sort of the, the thing we struggled with was like, where does culture come from in a company? And um, it's weird. Like whenever you get like 10 or 15 people together, there's sort of like this culture organically just pops out of the universe. And the, the thing we learned was like culture can evolve organically, just like you have 10 or 15 people and there's a culture. And by the time you're 25 people, the culture's there. But I'm much more of a fan of what's the culture you want to have and talk about it as a team and prospectively drive towards that. Um, and that should link to your team and your product and all fit together. And I think you have to loop those three things together. Um, it turns out there's a really one question that I found to be super productive in terms of having this culture conversation with your team to be like, how do you want to define your culture? Because sometimes it turns into this really annoying gym poster conversation where everybody goes up to the whiteboard and writes like inspiration and innovation. And everybody's like, ah, like, that's, like <laughs> totally useless. <laughs> so the one question that we stumbled into that turned out to be really helpful is let's talk about the places we've worked in the past. What did we like about the culture and what did we not like about the culture? And that gets really specific, really fast. You end up with this, like, this table full of mosaics of different cultural things that you can start to form into, hey, we really kind of want to do this and we don't want to be like that. And it allows you to get really concrete about culture and it'll bring in what's your product and what's your customers and what's your team. It sort of naturally does that. I don't think one drives the other more than that. I think those three things come together to form your culture. But the punchline is be deliberate about it, not accidental. Yeah, I, I would take uh, uh, the way I look at the question, which is a great question, and the chicken and egg is, I, I think in terms of trying to figure out which causes the other is the wrong way of looking at it. Instead, what's important is the two have to be consistent and tightly integrated and work together. Because if they don't, then the company will fail. And, and the best example of that is that if you have like a product-led culture and your go-to-market strategy is sales-led, then it will fail or vice versa. Um, a good example, well, maybe not a good example, but I'll, I'll go out and sort of say something that may be a uh, heresy, but I, I think, you know, Google and GCP is inherently going to struggle in the cloud business. And, and the reason for it is, is that uh, 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 cloud is fundamentally a service business where you're serving your customers. And Google has a very strong product uh, uh, technology culture where if engineers don't like what they're working on, they can transfer to a different group. And, and so that culture is very strong for product and technology, but not the best for customer service. That is really fascinating. And I think actually dovetails very well with actually kind of the perspectives of salespeople that I know at Google. Um, mm -hmm. And where, where I compare it to, you know, I, I work for a Microsoft owned company and I also have very many friends at Amazon, uh, you know, kind of the clout and the level of intensity of those sales cultures and even the compensation plans, everything screams customer focus, customer obsession. Uh, and that is such an interesting point that that can actually translate into the, uh, it doesn't matter how good your product is, you know, how innovative Google GCP is, but that level of customer obsession that's needed in the cloud business will set them back. Thank you for that, Tahi. Uh, I want to bring out another uh, comment and question from Shankar uh, Venkatram and my colleague at, at LinkedIn. Uh, first off, he says, Tahi, so spot on, read GCP. I'm hearing that from clients who are leaning towards Azure over GCP. 
Shout out for the Microsoft stockholders in the room. Thanks, Chunker. But he also asks of Bob, uh, when do you know it's time to leave a company like your experienced post airspace acquisition by Cisco? Um, wow, that's another like question that there's no one good rule for that. It's very personal. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that go into deciding to change jobs. Um, the, you know, Part of it is how tied do you feel you are? Part of it's just your long-term thinking. One of the things you'll notice in a company is sometimes you're like, man, I'm really thinking about what needs to happen six months from now, a year from now, 18 months from now. And that's a good sign that you're sort of emotionally like connected and bought in and you're, you're ready to keep going. One of the things that I noticed sort of both myself and I've seen it happen with people that I've worked with is when that time horizon changes and all of a sudden you're not thinking sort of beyond three or six months, like double click on that and really look into why that is. Sometimes maybe you need to find a different role inside the company. Sometimes it may be it's time to leave the company. Sometimes having an issue with your boss, whatever it is, like those are all contribute to it. Um, for me, actually, the reason why I left Cisco to go start Mobile Iron was uh, I was actually having a good time at Cisco. I was actually having more fun than I thought. But when AJ and Suresh showed me the idea, I, I just kind of had this, oh crap, I got to go do that moment. So. Sometimes you just have this, oh crap, I got to go do that, <laughs> which was, that was my case in that example. Got it. There was a pull, that instinct. I love it. You know, uh, one of my favorite books, I cite it all the time, is Jonathan Haidt's uh, 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 The Righteous Mind, where he talks about the idea of, you know, logic and intuition are like a man riding an elephant. The logic thinks it's running the show, but it's that elephant that actually has got the control, and that's instinct. And I, I love that poll. Um, Tehi, I'd love to see if you have any response to that question that Shankar has. Like, how do you know when maybe a member of an executive team of a portfolio company, like, it's their time to move on? Is there any any telltale signs that you would ask that person to think about? Um, you know. Uh, uh, it, it, I think what you're talking about a situation where you have an executive who was like a, a superstar at the company has been critical in the success of the company up to that date, but it's sort of like struggling at that point. And is that the scenario that you're sort of alluding to? I'm trying to, or, or someone that, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it has other missions in life. And as a result, looking for the transition. Absolutely. Uh, which, which transition are you uh, uh, referring to? <laughs> That's well said. Um, we have a uh, another few uh, questions from Judy Bello, the, uh, the the matriarch of 99 Pages. She asks, from whom do you seek feedback on your passionate ideas to help assess their viability for both development and success? So, uh, Bob, I'd love to, so let's say you hear this idea from uh, Suresh and AJ. Uh, to found Mobile Iron, enterprise mobility, their iPhones, and they need security and management in the enterprise. Boom, you got that uh, that fire. Who did you call to to verify whether you weren't crazy or not? <laughs> so uh, it comes down to market and customers. Like at the end of the day, like you got to start with the customers and the problem work backwards. So there's a lot of really cool ideas you might be able to get excited about, but if you can't figure out whether there's customers behind it or not, then think think deeply about whether that's the right thing to go do. Uh, for me, it's really just go talk to customers and make sure that they actually care about what you're thinking about. And that kind of dispassionate feedback, you can get really passionate about something. The people you want feedback from, or you want them to be super clinical and not emotional about it. And uh, you know, I think the answer to that for me is number one is customers. Um, yeah, I think that, that's sort of the difference between like B2B and B2C kind of startups that mm, B2B, right. yeah. it really helps if you can find the right teaching customers. Um, in, in a way, the right, uh, uh, actually the champion at the teaching customer is almost like, and thinks of himself or herself as like an early founder of the company. So like their first 10 uh, customers of Mobile Iron, I remember sort of are proud of that. And are, are and view themselves almost like they're like founders of the the company. Yeah, some so, of our I, early customers actually came to our IPO in New York. Actually, fantastic! I love it. Uh, so I love, and actually, if I'm not mistaken, even uh, the release names that we would have, like every you know V dot 
X, Y, Z. Yeah. I believe if I'm not mistaken, we actually named it for a customer or for a yeah, city the that they were based in or something. Yeah. The internal name for all our, uh, software releases over time, we basically sequentially named them after the, the city that the, our, cu our early customers came from. And, you know, part of that was a culture question, which brought up earlier that one of the things that was really important from culture is that we and our customers win together. You sort of start with the customer and work backwards. And, you know, that is a culture question. Like, do you think that actually that's the right way to run a business and build a culture that happened to be what we thought there's other people that will have different views and there's no right or wrong. But for us, that was, um, that was a big part of it. And yeah, uh, we named our releases after customers. Fantastic. Um, if I, we have some more great questions coming through in the chat. Uh, would love to bring in ah, Swati Patel. Uh, do you believe there is a general model for successful tech companies? Specifically, could you comment on distribution centric versus product centric companies? Uh, any comments on that? Uh, Tehi, why don't we throw this one at you? You evaluate a lot of these companies. When you uh, do you differentiate between say like uh, product centric ones, distribution centric ones, like any general model that you kind of gravitate towards in the enterprise? Both can work pretty well. I mean, when I think of distribution centric, I mean, like, uh, let's say like a sales led company, you know, uh, uh, versus a, a product led uh, or a product centric company. So I, I find that uh, it's not like one strategy is better than others all the time. But instead, what it really is, is sort of you have to make sure that you have complete alignment between what the, uh, the, the customers that you're going after, how they buy with uh, uh, how you want to sell and the technology and the team. And if you have alignment and you're the best for that, you'll win. If there's a company which has a alignment with a better solution, then you'll lose. Bob, anything to add? <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> uh, so I'll tell you something that drives me absolutely berserk is in the technology community, there sort of becomes fads where it's like something's cool and interesting and everybody says, you got to go do that. And this is a great example. Product led sales is the best. Every company should go be product led sales because it's faster, lower sales and marketing. The venture capitalists love it. Like, look, it's great. Um, I think the punchline of this is there is no right or wrong one answer for what the right go to market model is for your business. You know, there is no one right answer for everybody. The only right answer is what's the right one for you and your business and your product and your customers, which lines up at the point that you got to look at that and figure out what to do and kind of back into what the right thing to do is. There is no one right or wrong answer. And anybody that tells you that is like giving you really bad advice. Yeah. And what I see that happens is that uh, people want to do one thing and their DNA or their product is another. And so you have misalignment. That's well, their customers buy a different way. Like, hey, we want yeah. to go do product-led growth, but our customers make committee decisions. Like, you know, it's not going to work. <laughs> well said. I like it. Great question, Swathi. Um, So Judy has asked a question that I think translates really well into a topic from the book. And I want to make sure we get to Survival to Thrival, which has been this wonderful pair of books that uh, I think for enterprise focused entrepreneurs, there's really nothing like it. Like on my bookshelf of, you know, entrepreneurial books that I've read, a lot of Ben Horowitz, I uh, got some, you know, uh, lean startup in there as well. But the focus on the enterprise startup here, I think is critical. And Judy's question is this, to what extent do the qualities that enable uh, startup founders to succeed overlap with the qualities that facilitate sustained operation of a, let's just say an established company. So Bob, this leads me to your, one of the key theses of the book, which is the unlearning of a CEO. Would you mind walking our viewers through your framework? So yeah, the, uh, it's funny, uh, so the inspiration for writing the second book where the punchline was on learning, like many things in life, inspiration, is driven by frustration. So frustration was sort of the mother of inspiration on this one. And I'll tell you what the frustration was, is that um, as a first time CEO, I really didn't understand how much sort of as the company changed, my job changed, and therefore I had to change. And um, 
having gone through that journey, it was actually really frustrating that I didn't sort of understand that going into it. And I kind of wish somebody actually sat me down and talked to this or their resources to look at to talk about this. And there wasn't really anything out there and kind of frankly just pissed me off. Um, <laughs> so that was one of the motivations for, for writing the book and sort of this theme unlearning. So, um, you know, the, we came up with an analogy that sort of worked for me and maybe it works with folks on in your audience, but uh, I'll go ahead and share it, which is that, you know, in the beginning of a company, like the skills that make you successful as an early time CEO, first time CEO and an early team is it's kind of like Captain America or Wonder Woman and like the platoon in the woods. Like you're digging ditches, you're throwing punches, you're getting punched, you're getting dirty, you're bouncing into trees. It's like you and the platoon in the woods and it's a blast. But then as the company gets to about 50 people and you start bringing on an executive team, it changes. Instead of being like Captain America and Wonder Woman and the platoon in the woods, it becomes something different. And it's more like the Avengers, where you have a band of superheroes, each of whom has a special superpower that's better than yours. And your job is to hire the Avengers, lead the Avengers, get them all pointed in the right direction. And in order to do that, like you have to hire people that are better, smarter, whatever they do, you have to be able to let go. You have to deal with the insecurity of them calling all the stuff you worked on ugly. So this transition from, you know, Captain America, Wonder Woman to the Avengers is really about letting go. And um, yeah, that was a, it's a hard transition for a lot of founding CEOs because the very things that make you successful in the early days, you kind of have to unlearn because those are the exact things that then get in your way and like make it hard to be the Avenger CEO. And I'll tell you, like, unless you let go and make that transition, like grade A executives will not come work for you. Or if they do, they're gonna quit. <laughs> like if you were them, would you wanna work for you? <laughs> um, and then, so that's phase two. And then the third phase, which hit when we were about four or 500 people, was you go from Captain America and the Avengers to more like uh, Professor Xavier in the X-Men where it felt like you're the dean of a university where you've got this you know this army of or you've got these teachers that are bringing up the next generation they're also your warriors and you as the ceo have to do a lot fewer things but do those fewer things for a lot more people and so you find yourself repeating yourself over and over and over and over and over and over again because your job is to actually focus on winning the war not any particular battle and you know the transition from role to role kind of sneaks up on you. It snuck up on me, and sort of unlearning the old role and relearning the new role was a particularly painful sort of transition, I think for me, and I think for most people. And um, you know, the, the punchline there is unlearning is hard, but it's actually the key ingredient. And uh, yeah. we got a lot of stories behind that. So Tahi watched it. It was kind of messy, but you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing I just like to add to it is that what makes it even harder is that your job title doesn't change. So this kind of evolution happens, whether you're CEO, VP of sales, VP of marketing, uh, uh, or even a board member. Everybody. And, yep. Yeah. So it, it's just inherent with uh, the company changing. And as a result, uh, 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 the person needs to either change or be changed for the betterment of the company. And what motivated us is that, uh, um, you know, a as leaders, you know, unfortunately, we've gone through so many situations where a person who is a superstar today struggles in the future. And so as a result, for the benefit of the company, you know, I sort of have to make this change. And uh, at the same time, what we realized is that there's so many stuff written about fi finding like product market fit or some business issue, but very little about how you as a person need to develop as the startup develops. Um, and because no one wants to talk about getting fired. I mean, the whole purpose of this was really is, you know, how not to get fired. And so um, that that's a, a, a topic that we came in. And, you know, uh, let me, try to say, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to relate one related story because uh, yes. uh, um, came and that is, you know, we talked about this sort of superstar to CEO uh, as a, a, a mere moral challenge, and you know, this is where the the CEO has a really tough dilemma with a VP who was a superstar in the past and really drove the company, helped 
the company's success, but is struggling now and maybe not the right person going forward. Because if the CEO makes a change too early, then uh, the team, the culture, the people in the company will believe the CEO has no loyalty. But if the CEO moves too quickly and make, I mean, too slow in making the change, then the team views the CEO as being indecisive. And in a rapidly growing startup, this gap between no loyalty and being indecisive could be six months. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, Bob. Did you have something to add? Uh, oh, yeah. no. Tay's exactly right. I just this, you know, this is sort of a personal, kind of an emotional topic for me because you know, having been through it myself, and then every team goes through it, and you know, it's sort of a frustration with our entrepreneurial community that people don't talk about this. So I'll tell you how it usually gets talked about, which drives me absolutely berserk, is people get told, you need to scale. <laughs> what the heck does that mean? That is totally unactionable. And so, you know, <laughs> I think what people are really saying is you need to change how you're working. You need to unlearn your old role, learn your new role. You need to, what, like, that's a much more productive conversation. This like code name, you need to scale is like, all right, that's super unhelpful. <laughs> I'm laughing because it, in my multiple startup failures, that has been like a number one word that I always just do this, whatever I hear. I, I, I hear you completely. Oh man, that hit close to home, Bob. Well said. <laughs> oh, just scale. I don't, come on, dude. Just scale. What does that mean? It's so easy. <laughs> Uh, all right, our live questions are going off the chain. I'm real excited about it. All right, I want to call out definitely a hotshot entrepreneur named Josh Mechanic, founder and CEO of Agora Maps, working in the utility space. A really interesting uh, uh, application of innovation entrepreneurship. Hi, Josh. Uh, <laughs> Josh asks, you alluded to the founder's journey as being long, full of ups and downs. Any advice for founders on how to invest in and preserve your personal wellness along the way uh, to position for long-term success? I think this is a really awesome question. And Bob, like, goodness, the your you know journey with Mobile Iron must have been almost ten years. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. I mean, like, that is a marathon, and you were charging hard the whole time. Like, how did you? keep yourself tethered to reality, grounded, human? What were some of those things you did? Uh, so it's hard. Um, you know, anybody that sort of gives you one line or platitudes with sort of an easy answer to this question, there is not one. Um, the, you know, I think I'll sort of say what worked for me, sort of, but not really, um, is that when you're a, in early, when you're an executive in an early company that then grows, like it's really hard to build something. And then you got to learn and unlearn on your way. So you got to change yourself. And like, it is crazy intense. Like I probably, I was probably 80, 90 hours a week for eight, nine years at Mobile Iron. And you could argue that's totally unsustainable. And yeah, you're right. It is unsustainable. So the question how is in the face of that, do you sort of balance it? Um, for me, it became about just effective. Number one was draw some boundaries. Like I would kill it during the week and then I would try and at least shut off for part of the weekend. And that was sort of my own personal way. Some people sort of compartmentalize differently. So just draw boundaries. Even if the what's, what's, what's in the other box is still really small, just make sure there's something there. Um, and the other one, uh, which was actually kind of frustrating for my team actually, um, and I think they would sort of vouch for this, is in order to maintain some level of clinicality and dispassion about the business, I sometimes would maintain some emotional distance and need sort of a place in my life where I was just Bob and not the CEO. And you know, a good example of that is I got married when we were at Mobile Iron and I didn't invite anybody from the company. And I really wanted to actually, because I really would, would have liked to have everybody there. But honestly, I just really wanted my wedding. I just wanted to be Bob in my wedding. I didn't want to have coworkers and colleagues there. I didn't invite Tehi. I didn't invite any board. Like, I, like, and so creating a little bit of those spaces where you can sort of be who you are outside of work was sort of the only way at least I could sort of maintain some level of sanity. Everybody would come up with their own 
things that work for them. But for me, that was sort of one of the uh, survival skills that, or survival strategies I had. Yeah, and you can't invite mobile iron people to your wedding. We, you know, we can't hold our liquor well. I've been to enough <laughs> SKOs. That, that was a good move on your part. <laughs> Tahi, I'd love to hear your uh, your reaction. Uh, you, you know, you yeah, charge hard uh, too. I mean, I, I know that uh, the management team, in particular CEOs, under tremendous pressure and stress. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, inflicted by the board and myself, so I, I understand that. So the way I look at it is, is that uh, there, there are two things. Is uh, first is uh, um, uh, the, the the CEO is going through an unbelievable emotional roller coaster. You can go from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, like in five minutes, and with these huge swings, and that's just that kind of emotional roller coaster is very hard on anyone you know, especially the, the, the CEO. And so what I try to do is to dampen it. So when it's high uh, and I, I hear great news, I just react by saying it's never that great. And when it's low, you know, this equal way of this life is never that bad. So trying to dampen the emotional roller coaster to the extent that I can. So that's one, because I feel like that really helps uh, uh, stabilize more. And then the other is to understand as a board member, uh, it, it's always a challenge between, am I providing the right focus or is this the wrong distraction? And, and so before I sort of shine a spotlight on something and sort of push something it, is to understand, you know, am I driving a, a good focus or am I creating a massive distraction for the company? And it's not to say I, I don't create distractions which are wrong, but at least I think about it consciously before. That's super interesting. And, and you know, we had a, a question from Cynthia Abbott. Uh, she and her husband founded Query. Uh, Query is a startup that does uh, uh, that helps job seekers uh, optimize their job search. Super important uh, in this past year, 2020, with the ups and downs we've had. Uh, so Cynthia asks. And I think this is particularly unique in a COVID world. How do you re recommend drawing these boundaries as we move into a space of work and life being commingled, right? I mean, we're working from home. Uh, your laptop is simultaneously your home theater, your portals for your professional life, your social media connections to the outside world. Uh, how do you compartmentalize in a COVID space your work and your personal life? Bob, I would love to start with you. Wow. That is like the $64 million question that several hundred million people in this country and around the world are sort of wrestling with right now. Particularly if you have like kids or younger kids at home, like man, like that is really rough. Um, I wish I had some blazing insight or suggestion <laughs> on that. Um, you know, I think it's little things like have a space where you can work. I think it's, you know, taking timeouts and going for a walk. I, I have some friends who do the virtual commute where instead of walking to their back office or wherever it is, they go outside and walk around the block twice like they're commuting. You know, there's little things like that you can do. But, um, you know, I think we're all still figuring this out. Uh, I wish I had sort of a whizzy suggestion. Great question. <laughs> Tehi, any, any cool startups in your, in your docket right now that solve this problem for us? Uh, no, unfortunately, we don't have one that solves us. Like, psychology of this but it's it's definitely something that we're all living through right now yeah well uh cynthia i tell you what i'll let you know if we hear a good answer uh if anybody has a good idea oh. please throw it in the chat i'm sure we're all struggling with it. Yeah. um Ma uh, mahi gunturu asks um and i think this is interesting in, in in almost in your evolution of writing the book is how would you compare your like the survival to thrival philosophy to say blitz scaling uh, from Reed Hoffman, or I'd even take it one step further, any of the other literature we talked from Eric Reese or Ben Horowitz, like when you were thinking about writing this book and creating your own space, what, what did you find say missing in this, you know, that quote unquote scale story of a company that you wanted to fill in? And uh, just, and then a second question he brings up, which I will, we'll table it for now, but how do you decide when to refresh your board if you have the option does how do you manage a board and refresh it does that help periodically uh but let's start with this first one in the formation of the book when you looked at the literature out there how did you know where you wanted to fit in and what was missing well the the, the you know like i mentioned earlier sort of 
frustration is often the mother of inspiration. So I think one of the things that I felt as a B2B entrepreneur out there is that Silicon Valley, fundamentally, we're a product shop. We're really good at building products. But I think we do a relatively poor job of helping entrepreneurs build good markets on the back of those products. And it gets sort of uh, institutionalized in how we talk about our world. And I think, you know, Mark and Dreesen in the product market fit world did a huge service for building companies by creating a mental framework for finding that early stage of product market fit for how do you get to your first 10 or 15 customers? How do you prove they can give you money? How do you prove you're delivering value? Like that is a super important thing to do. And then Reed Hoffman with Blitzscaling is sort of like, all right, repeatable sales, go invest a lot, go really big, go really big. The part that was missing was sort of that thing in between, which is, hey, you won your first 20 customers. It's not the same thing as unlocking growth. And there's like this weird missing link between product market fit and unlocking growth that a lot of companies get stuck in. And what happens is they get to their first 20 customers, they go raise series A and say, go, go hire sales and marketing. They raise their burn, they hire a bunch of people. And then they wake up six months later and they have, they went from 22 customers to 24 to 25. And everybody's looking around going, oh crap, our burn rate went up. We're not really growing much faster. And there's a missing link in between here. So the, the sort of big punchline in book one is a concept called go to market fit, which is, you know, how do you build that how do you find urgency how do you build that repeatable playbook to find and win customers over and over again and then how do you figure out how to measure whether it's working or not like you have to figure out go to market fit before you can go blitz scale <laughs> uh but you got to do it sort of after you've already figured out you can win 20 customers so this this concept to go to market fit i think was trying to fill in this gap for this missing link between finding product market fit and unlocking growth and Tay, I'll sort of hand it to you because I've done this once, but you've done you've worked with a lot more companies on this topic. So, no, I, I absolutely. That was the inspiration of the first book was, uh, uh, and then using that to build out the rest of the company journey from all the way from startup to becoming, you know, after you find go to market fit, you would scale to become a category leader, and then you transcend your category to become an industry leader, and it's a path from basically zero to a billion in revenue. And so trying to have in one place so that you can sort of see the, the whole journey, just like we were talking about earlier, Rajiv, about raising a child, you know, <laughs> uh, to just sort of see the, the whole journey in that manner. Um, and, and then the, the second book was based on the inspiration that uh, 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 superstars would struggle at the next stage. And the answer was, you know, we need to change them. But, you know, how can we help them change became the inspiration for the second book. I think Rajiv seems to be frozen here. Okay, let's give him a minute. I'm sure he'll. Uh... Okay. The uh, here we can just go ahead and hit some of the questions off okay. the uh, chat box. <laughs> yep. So we'll wait for Rajiv's uh, internet connection to come back. Um, let's see. Um, have you ever employed lean startup model and cover product market fit? Thoughts on lean startup model? Um, like, I think lean startup's a great model. Product market fit's super important. If you don't own product market fit, you don't get to pass go. Um, the, uh, the challenge is sometimes founders fall in love too much with whatever their initial idea is and they become sort of dogmatic about it and miss product market fit because they're sort of overly dogmatic about what the right answer is. And then the second core challenge is once you find product market fit, then then what? And uh, a lot of entrepreneurs get told, well, go hire sales. <laughs> and that doesn't really cut the mustard. Yeah. So I, uh, I think the uh, uh, finding product market fit is really important and lean startup helps in that. But uh, from an investor standpoint, just because you find product market fit doesn't make you an attractive company to invest in. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. actually mean you have a good business. Exactly. Right. You know, whether you found it or haven't, it's great. I mean, it's like necessary, but not sufficient. So what what's in this world right now is, is the on, on one. It's all about unlocking growth. If you can't unlock growth, there's uh, uh, probably 100,000 startups worldwide that, in that category. They're all urgently looking to raise money. But if you unlock growth, 
there's trillions of dollars right now in cash looking for high growth companies and instantly going in and making companies unicorns. So what separates these two worlds is unlocking growth. And that's why we call the book, you know, going from survival to thrival and why go to market fit was such an important concept because that is the formula for unlocking growth. And that marks the transition from survival to thrival. And one thing we're doing is because since we came out with a book and coined the term survival of thrival is that many people have come and asked us for more guidance, more examples on how to find go to market fit. And so um, Bob and I are working on a, a new version of uh, the chapter on how to find go to market fit and just making it uh, free online. So yeah, we're going to open, we're going to open yeah. source the book. <laughs> so giddy up. Um, the, uh, actually, what we want to do is to make the beta version early so we can write with the, the audience and they can ask us questions or that we can embed or even stories that they can add to it as well. The um, Yeah, looking forward to that. I'm, uh, it's going to be fun. The uh, AT, I thought I'd sort of share this story around go-to-market fit that was sort of me as a clueless first-time CEO sort of first figuring this out. So... Um, for many of you in the audience that may be sort of semi-product-centric founders, kind of like I was, um, that as a product-centric founder, how I translated this idea, oh, you need to go find a repeatable playbook to find customers over and over again, I translated that into, I need a better PowerPoint pitch. And some of you out there may have actually made the same translation in your heads. And I'll tell you, that's not it. <laughs> the... The repeatable go-to-market playbook is sort of how do you find and win customers over and over again through the customer journey and then make them successful. And it's it really becomes like the operating system for your go-to-market. And I learned this from uh, uh, the VP of sales. We hired Mobile Iron John Donnelly about like the importance of a go-to-market playbook. And I could tell you it's hard to get it right and it's hard to build it. But once you get it, it's magic because you now have the recipe to find and win customers over and over and over again. And the entire company knows how to support it and be able to do it. And um, it's way more than a PowerPoint pitch. So <laughs> for those of you out there that made the same conclusion leap that I did when I was a product centric founder, uh, uh, it's not the same thing. Hey, Rajiv, welcome back. Yes. Good to see you. <laughs> hey, sorry about I am. Sorry about that. This is a first for 99. I haven't had a, a power outage uh, with, the power, uh, with the internet thus far yet. So fingers crossed it doesn't happen yet. I apologize about that, gentlemen. Uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, I'm not sure if uh, you were able to read the chat questions that were coming in, but uh, they can. Yeah, we were. To, we just, uh, to we just started in. answering right. questions. Oh, fantastic. Um, I want to make sure that uh, did we happen to answer Samir Patel's question by any chance uh, from LinkedIn? Uh, we answered the one about lean startup. Uh, ah, perfect. Is that the one? No, okay. we're going to, uh, I'll uh, go ahead uh, and ask uh, on his behalf. He is asking, how do we know how we have sized? Our, he's asking, uh, how do we know how we've sized our market correctly? Uh, and, you know, I think this is particularly interesting for enterprise companies. You know, there's a ton of information that's out there theoretically, but it's, I think it's fairly easy to convince yourself of a market size by a few uh, uh, kind of tangential statistics. So how do you assess the size of an enterprise market? What do you, uh, what, what kind of metrics are you looking for? Tay, you want to take that one since you yeah, talked about it. As a, an early stage investor, I, I really just take a, a, a bottoms up view. You know, because usually if you meet a company that, let's say, has product market fit, but has not unlocked growth and found good market fit, you know, by the first 10, 20 customers, the ACV with them, you sort of get an idea of uh, what it could be. And then based on that, you can have a, a bottoms up view. And then by looking at the product roadmap and talking to customers, what they could then upsell or cross sell to expand their ARPU with their customer. <laughs> we lost, uh, oh yeah all right so we need to do that size of market question so i, I do want to add uh, another so the answer i gave you is the first answer of just like how big is the uh the market for the insertion point but then the, the second thing that i ask is okay 
uh, you know, once you insert yourself in the market is that can you then become a strategic platform for the customer? Because if you can, then there's so many opportunities then to upsell, cross sell or do other things rather than just looking at, you know, I've got this, let's say, particular product with this ACV for this customer. But if you're not a strategic platform, the reverse is there's a chance you could get ripped out because uh, uh, someone else builds a platform and then adds your product as a feature to that platform. The, uh, hey T, how about we, uh, I've got, there's another question here we'll go ahead and take. So you just sort of talked about evaluating market. Uh, how about, how do you evaluate CEOs when, you know, they, they show up and pitch you for the first time, you know, and how you decide to make an investment? Like, what are the things you look for? You know, the, the main question, as I uh, mentioned earlier, is just simply asking myself the question, you know, do I want to be, you know, part of this company journey for the next five or 10 years? And so by doing that, I'm asking myself, you know, I want to know about the vision. Is that a vision I believe in? Do I feel good about the culture of the company? And do I believe that uh, uh, now on the, the, the company journey side is, you know, have they found product market fit or do I believe they can find product market fit, find go to market fit, unlock growth and become the category leader? Because uh, the uh, the destination for me is to make the company into a category leader um, because then that will be a, a successful outcome for all the people involved in the company. And then after that, then maybe they can transcend the category to the next step. So then how, okay. So that's, you're sort of looking at the company, figuring out the opportunity. What about like, as you're actually just looking at the CEO, like how do you evaluate the CEO as whether they're somebody you want to, invest in and work with? Like, what do you yeah. look for in a CEO? Um, what, what I look for first is uh, uh, the whys or the passion, you know, what motivates the person and, and on this startup journey. So I, I, I look at passion. The second thing I look for is uh, self-awareness. And the way I ask about self-awareness is, you know, how have you learned from failure? you know, to see whether they've acknowledged that they've had failure to understand that how they're going to learn because all of us have made mistakes and, you know, we need to learn from uh, self-awareness. And then the third thing is uh, I, I ask myself is, uh, do I believe that the, the CEO can develop a systems view of the company? Because without a systems view, uh, it will result in uh, uh, poor decisions getting made. You can be a great VP without a systems view, but you can't be a good CEO without a systems view. What about like how important is understanding of the domain uh, specifically relative to those other three things? Uh, it, it's it's important to understand the domain, uh, um, but you could have let's say a co-founder who understands the domain even better. So someone in the team, the founding team, needs to really understand the domain. But it doesn't but have to do, be the CEO. So what I do is I, I separate certain skills that I believe the CEO has to have versus what's required in the founding team. Yeah, the uh, you know, it's interesting sort of from my perspective, being a first time CEO, like the things I wish like I'd kind of known about the job and sort of what I learned about myself. One is it's a spectacular learning experience. Like it's crazy. Like you learn so much about building a company, about a market, about everything. Like it's, it's a spectacular learning experience. Uh, the second thing, it's a relatively painful exercise in self-awareness. <laughs> so, you know, you learn a lot about yourself along the way. And Tay's point about self-awareness is critical because like, and it's it applies to the organization too. Like, clinical feedback, being able to look in the mirror and assess, you know, honestly assess what's going well and what's not going well is super important to learning and changing. And the third one we sort of hit on earlier, which is it's really hard to draw boundaries <laughs> as a CEO. Like, um, so like I call it the Saturday morning problem. Like if you have four hours on a Saturday morning, how do you spend it? Do you spend it with your family? Do you spend it with friends? Do you spend it doing what you want to do? Or do you spend it trying to help make the company better and the 400 families that are betting on you as CEO to make the company better? Like that gets really personal really quickly. 
and you feel sort of this low grade stress constantly. Um, so those were sort of my sort of three surprises about what it felt like to be a first time CEO. Um, but it's a spectacular learning experience. You sort of come out the other side. Um, I think a better person. Um, I guess other people around me will have to decide that or not. Bob say, hey, I want to uh, forgive me for these technical difficulties we had. It's, it's Lake Tahoe internet. So it's the reading capital of the world, not the internet capital of the world. Let's put it that way. Uh, and uh, I hope you don't mind if I, if I uh, start moderating again. Can you guys hear and see me okay? Yeah, I'll, yeah. back to you. Sorry, Rajiv. All good. We were just oh, I, riffing. I, you guys are the stars of the show, right? Uh, the, the good content happens typically when I leave. So um, <laughs> I want to bring in another question from uh, Mahi. Um, and I think this is particularly interesting considering what we saw in the private, excuse me, the public markets uh, uh, earlier this week with GameStop, AMC, Blockbuster. I mean, it was just insane, right? Um, are the valuations in the private market reflecting or increasing uh, the activity that we see in the public markets? Are these interrelated? Um, and uh, especially with the speed and gravitas of some of these big tech IPOs, um, it seems like there might be a little bit of, of um, a, a gray space between where the private and public markets are playing right now. Curious if, uh, Tehi, I would love to maybe start with you. Are you seeing a lot of effects from the private private markets into the public markets? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, I, at this point, they basically almost become like the same market. And, and it's because basically they're the same investors. So the, the hedge funds uh, uh, and others that buy in, and the, mutual, the uh, mutual funds that buy in the IPOs and public markets are the same ones doing late stage private deals right now. So as a result, there's, uh, it's the same investor. How about that? Bob, any thoughts? I'll defer to Tehi on that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, and, and I I apologize that we uh, I was offline for a little bit because I wanted to make sure we hit, hit on this one part of your book, um, part of swim lanes. Uh, so, Bob, one of the most telling and, and transparent moments, and I can't remember if I heard it on your book or on, in your podcast, but you um, you talked about this moment where this that your your team sat you down as CEO. And they said to you, we're not getting from you what we need. Mm -hmm. And you use this uh, formation of swim lanes, a framework of swim lanes to kind of help you organize your time and your focus on helping the company grow. Could you uh, explain to our viewers what you were talking about? Yeah, so um, yeah, this was, a, this was one of the particularly poignant unlearning moments for me as a first time CEO. So the context here is, uh, you know, I'd been in Captain America, Wonder Woman, Platoon in the Woods mode. And we now are about 40, 50 people. And we started to have different teams. You know, we now start had a little bit of a good market team. We had a marketing team. We had a customer success team. And, um, you know, my natural sort of things that I was good at and like to do is sort of product and go-to-market stuff. And so I tended to sort of spend my time there because that's what I like to do. That's what I was good at when we were in Captain America and Wonder Woman and Two in the Woods. That's what I was spending my time on. But what started to happen as we grew is that effectively, I was not being the CEO of the whole company. And so, you know, I give my team a lot of credit. They sat me down and they said, hey, Bob, we're not getting from you what we need. It's like, ouch, <laughs> like that hurt. Um, but thank God they did. I gave them a ton of credit for having the courage to do it. And so, you know, it kind of was a punch in the face. It was like, all right, well, how do I think about this? How do I think about being the CEO of the whole company and make this transition from sort of the product -y CEO to CEO, CEO? And the mental framework, I worked with an executive coach on this, and she really helped me, is to sort of think about the company in swim lanes, which is if you sort of divide up what's happening in the company, there's customer stuff, go to market stuff, product stuff, financial stuff, and team stuff. I realize I'm being a little cheeky about it, but sort of big picture wise, those are roughly the swim lanes. Sure. And that was sort of step one. And then for step two was to think about like, what's the goal six months out in each one of those swim lanes? And then work backwards from there as to what the interim milestones are to be able to get there. And that exercise of forcing me to think about the whole, divide the company into swim lanes, 
think about the whole company. What are the goals and the different pieces work backwards, like allowed me to start thinking about like, okay, here is what needs to happen across the whole company. And oh, by the way, these swim lanes roughly mapped to different roles of my executives sort of helped me delegate. Um, and so it forced me to change my thinking to be thinking about the whole company. It had a really interesting secondary side effect, which is that um, it became really obvious how I was spending my time. <laughs> like it shined a big fat flashlight on that. I was spending most of my time in two swim lanes and kind of not spending time on the other swim lane. So it became sort of a really useful feedback loop for me to be paying attention to how I was spending my time. So it had sort of a double benefit. One was a way to be systems thinking about the whole company and what the goals are and the different work streams and how they interlock. And the second thing was, how do I spend my time? Now, there was an interesting tertiary benefit that uh, also came about. It was super useful for the team. Yeah. Because at that stage, you know, everybody sort of wants to know how the pieces fit together. How's this all going to work? And I had like an eight and a half by 14 sheet of paper, like one of the long pieces. And I basically drew it with pencil. Like this wasn't PowerPoint. Like I did it in pencil. It was like a living document. I had it pinned up on my wall and I still have it actually. Like that was, that became my mental map for the company for like the next year and a half. And uh, wow. it really helped me make that transition from being kind of the product CEO working on what I was good at to forcing myself to be the CEO of the whole company. You know what? Yeah, so Add, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, please. Yeah, because, uh, uh, I find that this idea of swim lanes to be incredibly powerful for first time CEOs is that the first thing is, is that as Bob outlined the swim lane, it's really nice to have one like line going across all swim lanes, which is your zero cash date. Because goals after your zero cash date are probably not as important as goals before your zero cash date uh, for the company to go past that for obvious reasons. And, and the second is the, the point that Bob brought up as well, and that is the idea of swim lanes is the first step for the CEO to look at the company as a whole system, to have a systems view of the company. And it, this is so important that uh, uh, every CEO have it, but especially for first time CEOs, because first of all, uh, no one else in the company is going to have a systems view but the CEO because the CEO is in a unique position where everything is reporting to the CEO. So the CEO is the only person in the company that can have a systems view, okay? And you need that to have that systems view because without it, what happens is, let's say, think of a balloon. A thing is air is popping out on one side, so you push that side in. Well, the air's gotta go somewhere, so it'll pop out on the other side. And so without <laughs> systems view, you don't see what the implications are. I'll, I'll give you a specific example is that if you have like a great VP of sales uh, that I've seen run the company as a first time CEO, the CEO is great with customers, that's great at, you know, fundraising, you know, can uh, uh, motivate the team with customers, is driving everything. But uh, uh, there's a tendency for a VP of sales to really believe the forecast uh, so much that they spend to the forecast. And so if there's any miss, then all of a sudden there's a, a huge cash burn, company's out of money, and it, it usually it can fail. Wow. So not understanding the financial implications of this uh, can kill the company. And so as a result, it's like having this holistic view of the whole system is, is really important. You know, there's a, a exceptionally well said, and I love that analogy of like the air and the balloon. Take. I think that, 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 that paints a very vivid picture. A word uh, during this uh, piece of the book uh, st stands out, and that's uh, the word dependencies um, in, in terms of, you know, okay, you have your swim lanes and it's important to understand uh, you know, where they're overlapping priorities, where they're, you know, some, some like there's a lot of people who are involved in the market Right. There's a lot of people who are reliant on finance outcomes, but to actually like outline these are the st things that need to happen in one swim lane in order for success in another. Like these are interdependent uh, system. It's a systems view, as, as you point out. I think it's exceptionally helpful. And the best, uh, the best example of a dependency is marketing, uh, not generating the pipeline that sales needs to close and marketing <laughs> MQL brand or other priorities. 
Exactly. But if they ever figure that out, I'm not going to have anyone to blame. So, you know, we're okay with them. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, hey, Richie, Rich, do you please. mind if I pile in on this? Because um, Please, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so this idea of dependencies turns out um, – shows up in a lot of different places. Like you do the swim lane, you see the work, see the goals work backwards, figure out the dependencies. Turns out dependencies in my mind is the biggest bug in using OKRs to run the company. So lots of companies out there use OKRs and that's yeah. great, you know, it's fine. But if you actually look at why things kind of get screwed up in companies or things get missed, usually it's not because one team didn't go hit their goals. It's because there's a dependency between one goal in one team and on another team that doesn't get done. They have and a bad handoff, basically. They have a bad handoff or a bad interconnect or bad dependency. And OKRs don't acknowledge that. So, you know, as part of getting the system view of the company in the swim lanes, like you start to see these dependencies. But then as you get to the next stage where you're in the Avenger stage, what you want is your, your team to be able to see those dependencies and manage those dependencies. So we basically didn't use OKRs. Effectively, we said, okay, here are our goals. But if I, I made sure that every one of my team executives specifically called out what are the dependencies they have on everybody else in the room. So there could be explicit acknowledgement that, hey, in order for me to achieve this goal, I'm dependent on you or I'm dependent on you. And sort of this thing about dependencies and sort of seeing them and getting ahead of them, like is really important for the CEO, but it turns out that that becomes just as important for the leadership team when the leadership team is the one that's really running the company. And it's a bug in OKRs that just ticks me off. So yeah. if you guys use OKRs out there, get explicit about interdependencies. But this idea of uh, interdependencies and not solving them turns out to be one of the key reasons why companies can't find go to market fit. Go to market fit is fundamentally a cross functional exercise between marketing, sales, customer success, and product. And uh, uh, if you have each one work to silos and you don't have the full cross-functional integration of those, then you will not find go-to-market fit. And, and so it's not something that can be owned by the VP of sales, uh, the VP of marketing, customer success, or VP of product, or CRO, because CRO doesn't own product. It really has to be owned by the CEO. Well said. I tell you what, that is, uh, Bob, the number of companies, teams, interactions I have professionally where the term OKR is throwing, thrown around. And it sometimes it, it, it almost leads to a little bit of an eye roll in some ways. It's almost, it's, it's almost a cliche. And I think you've articulated really succinctly why it kind of annoys me. It's like the, you know, we're not just individuals operating without a tether to a central mission. And it's that interdependency view, man, you know, ne next month, I'm going to try and get John Doerr on. We're going to talk about measure what matters, and we're going to poke holes into his OKR theory. That's uh, that's that's my next step. Uh, team, we are out of time, and Tehi and Bob have been super generous to not only basically run the broadcast when my internet goes out, but to even go over time. And uh, I am just so grateful for all the entrepreneurs who uh, uh, came in, asked great, interesting questions and made this a really lively discussion. The books are Survival to Thrival. I just put their website out. They have a podcast, uh, two really amazing books. And I slew, And I, are you guys still doing the, the, the GTM conference, the, the summit? We'll look at it when things calm down with COVID, but yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. The point is, is if you're involved in venture, uh, either as an entrepreneur, an investor, you're working for a startup, you're considering startup life, uh, I cannot think of a more valuable resource for any enterprise-focused startup than the Survival to Thrival, uh, not just the books, but the entire library of content. So please go out and check it out. Uh, folks, I, I'm again, I apologize for those technical difficulties. I still hope you enjoyed the broadcast. I know I certainly did. Uh, again, Bob Tinker, former CEO and co-founder of uh, Mobile Iron. Iron and Tehi Na, managing partner at Storm Ventures, authors of Survival to Thrival, these two awesome books about startups in the enterprise. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time on your Sunday with us. We really appreciate it. Our right. pleasure. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rajiv. Thank you. Everybody. All right, team. We're going to be back soon. Look out for us and uh, read safe.